Hey, this is Supernova, an atheist going through How Do We Know the Bible is True, Volume 1, edited by Ken Ham and Bodie Hodge. And today we're on Chapter 12. What about the factual claims in the Da Vinci Code? And as stated in the title, it's about factual claims, which I hate discussing because I am not an expert on either the Da Vinci Code or historical scholarship. But uh, this is written by a guy who's also not an expert. It's by Tim Chafee, the guy who wrote the, the last chapter. And again, he's he's a theologian. He has a lot of degrees in theology. He understands the Bible. But he doesn't know anything about the Da Vinci Code except what he's looked up. And the same here. I've tried to fact check him wherever possible. So uh, before I begin and, and dig right into his chapter, I should probably note that... Um, I, I read the Da Vinci Code. I've read all of Dan Brown's novels. But if you have not, this is going to be heavy on spoilers. We're going to go right into the, the twist revealed in the book. So if you haven't read it and don't want it spoiled, then don't watch this video. Go out and read it. It's a good book. And uh, if you haven't read it and don't care about spoilers, then I'm, I'm going to read verbatim uh, – what the author has put in here about the book, what the debates are over, so that you can be caught up and understand everything you you need to know about the book, so that you can follow along. So, uh, starting right off with his writing, uh, fact, all descriptions of artwork, architecture, documents, and secret rituals in this novel are accurate. Thus begins one of the best-selling, most controversial books in history. Dan Brown's action thriller became a cultural phenomenon and triggered a firestorm of debate due to many of the stories about Jesus Christ. The story involves a quest for a redefined Holy Grail. Rather than being the cup used by Christ during the Last Supper, as like claimed in uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Brown claims the Grail is Mary Magdalene. According to the story, Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married, and she was pregnant with his child when he was crucified. The apostles were jealous of Mary's role among the group, so she fled in fear to France where her descendants would eventually become French royalty. However, the apostles changed Christ's message so they could make the church patriarchal and suppress women. They tried desperately to destroy any documents or evidence that went against their claims. Uh, it goes a little bit into irrelevant stuff about the, contra uh, the conspiracy claims in the book. But it's just fiction, right? Everybody knows it's just a story, so why bother spending time refuting it? Yes, it's just fiction, but Brown's opening... Fact purports that much of the story is true as claims have deceived millions concerning the truth about the deity of Jesus Christ, his life, his ministry, and church history. And I really hate that. He tried to make it sound like even though it was a, a fictional book that it was based on all these factual historical uh, things that only historians know and just aren't known to the common public. I, I've encountered this before in like Michael Crichton's books, The Andromeda Strain and The Terminal Man are written as if they're true and he claims that they are true and it's frustrating because they're not. They're completely fiction. Dan Brown has done this himself in his other books. Like I said, I've read them all. He, uh, In The Lost Symbol, for instance, he's trying to get across the message of noetics, that people can change things just by thinking. And... Uh, uh, if you've ever heard of the experiment where somebody discovered that we all lose 16 grams when we die, suggesting that there's a physical soul and that it actually has weight, we find that the experiment is, is very unscientific. He had a very small sample size of less than 20 corpses, and they were in various stages of decomposition. Some of them weighed significantly more than they did when they died, and some of them weighed significantly less, and 16 grams was just an average among them. So it was very unscientific, and Dan Brown retells the experiment as somebody doing it with somebody who was just about to die, enclosed in this glass case on a scale, and as she died, she lost 16 grams, and she was enclosed where gas couldn't get in or out, because that's the, generally what uh, we believe uh does cause a corpse to gain or lose weight, gas getting trapped in or leaving the body. And so he, he retells the experiment in a way that makes it sound very scientific, but it, it, it wasn't and it's, it shouldn't be believed. So this is, this is something that Dan Brown does a lot. It's a fictional book and should be taken as a piece of fiction. How factual are Dan Brown's facts? And we have a, a little chart here that, uh, describes some of the factual claims in the Da Vinci Code, ones that are kind of irrelevant, and yet they were uh, told wrong anyway, such as claims in the Da Vinci Code. At 
President Mitterrand's explicit demand the pyramid at the Louvre consists of 666 panes of glass, which created a stir among conspiracy buffs who view 666 as the number of Satan. In reality, the Louvre's official website states that there are 673 panes of glass. It's obvious why he changed that in order to make the, the book a little more interesting, but he clearly told a lie about something that he shouldn't have. The Da Vinci's uh, painting The Last Supper did not show Christ's cup because da Vinci wanted to identify the Holy Grail as Mary Magdalene. In reality, The Last Supper was not painted to show Christ's announcement of the New Covenant at all when he used the cup, but was painted to show the moment that Jesus announced his betrayer. And I know that's true because I looked it up on Wikipedia. He cited the, the last fact as uh, from the Louvre's web, official website, and I hate that he didn't cite this one, but it, it appears that he's actually telling the truth here, the author of this chapter. Uh, again, something that, that was purposely changed in the book to make it more interesting, to add some more evidence to his claim when it was not true at all. Next section, Rewriting Church History. The Da Vinci Code repeats the common but erroneous belief that history is always written by the winners. Uh, Dan Brown has completely misrepresented and twisted church history. It seems his real goal is to promote Gnosticism, a popular belief system in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. And I think he did this because uh, Gnosticism is actually based on fact, and it's one that not many people know. So he was trying to throw some interesting facts in there to... Uh, you know, make it make it seem like the rest of the non-factual stuff was true, and also because it, it it's educational and that makes it interesting. And you think, oh, this is fascinating. Uh, he claims that at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325, that is where Jesus was deified and made into God, and. Uh, that's actually not true. If you look at, at Wikipedia under Council of Nicaea, this was a popular belief even without the Da Vinci Code. A lot of people believed in things that were at the Council of Nicaea, like uh, canonization of, of the New Testament stuff, and it, it wasn't. It was actually just not that important. And you can see that on Wikipedia, actually find out what the Council is about. The uh, Da Vinci Code claims more than 80 Gospels were con considered for the New Testament, and... Uh, the author, Tim, Cha Tim Chafee, here says there were never 80 competing Gospels, either only a handful of early Gnostic writings, and he lists some of them. And it's true, this number 80 seems to be completely made up. There was probably about 20 at most. Uh, and this is probably a great place to discuss, discuss canonization because uh, I've read this book cover to cover, and I don't recall it, the, the, any of the authors ever discussing how we got... Uh, the books that we got, how they were put into the Bible. If you look up biblical canon on Wikipedia, you'll see that a lot of uh, other types of Bibles exist that include uh, books that that our Western traditional Bibles don't. And uh, how how did the the books that we get uh, end up in in the Bible? Well, on uh, I remember on Penn and Teller's bullshit, there was an episode about the the Bible, and a historian claimed that the books that ended up in the Bible were the ones being read in church. They were the the very popular ones, which suggests that it was democratic. That the ones that ended up uh, being part of the Bible were just rather popular. Uh, I would consider uh, the Old Testament in Second Samuel and Joshua. We have two citations to the book of Jasher. For instance, in Joshua, when we have the, the battle in which the sun was suspended in the sky, which seems like an incredible claim, the author of Joshua says, is this event not also recorded in the book of Jasher, uh, also known as the book of the just man or the book of the upright? And... Uh, in Second Samuel 2, it's cited, and it seems like these authors expected you and intended you to have the book of Jasher so that you could uh, verify stories that were told in other biblical uh, canon books. And we don't have the book of Jasher for the reason that we don't have the book of Jasher. It would probably have been included if we had a manuscript of it, but we don't. It's lost history. It's, it's lost in time. 
And, and so it would be hard to argue that the book of Jasher doesn't belong in the Bible. And if we found an ancient manuscript, you'd think it would end up in the Bible. It would be very controversial because obviously Christians wouldn't want to admit that it should have been in the Bible all along. And we do have uh, what appears to be a forgery, one that dates back to the 1600s, that uh, is used by many Mormons even today, though it's not officially in the Book of Mormon. Uh, so it, it's it's very interesting why that one got lost. I mean, if God inspired what what uh, books ended up in the Bible, as many Christians would. Believe. I mean, it's not like the Bible has uh, a list of its internal components. You can't actually reference the Bible to find out what belongs in the Bible. Uh, I I look at books like uh, the the Minor Prophets. The Book of Nahum describes the destruction of Nineveh, and Nahum was obviously a prophet as a living. It's what uh, he did as a job, and so you would imagine that he came up with many more prophecies besides just the destruction of Nahum of Nineveh, which is what the entire book is about. And I think the only reason that that prophecy was published is because it came true. And the ones that didn't were considered non-gospel. They were just rejected on that fact. And I, I imagine that a lot of the uh, early prophets had their books uh, accepted or rejected the same way. There were, there were many prophets writing uh, many writings at, doing prophecy for a living and we don't have their writings and that's probably why because uh, most of their prophecies didn't come true so uh, it, one of these apocryphal gospels is called the uh, gospel of Philip and at one point in the Da Vinci Code one character tells another to read from the gospel of Philip in an effort to prove Jesus and Mary Magdalene was married according to the Gospel of Philip, and the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene. Christ loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on the mouth. The rest of the disciples were offended by it and expressed disapproval. There are several problems with this claim. Uh, the main one is the doc document is very old and has several holes, and we say the document because there is only one Gospel of Philip. There just happens to be a hole after kiss her often. So we don't know where Jesus allegedly used to kiss her, according to this document. You think, does it matter? A kiss is romantic. Well, in their culture, it wasn't necessarily. People would kiss each other's feet, kiss their hands, kiss their cheeks. There are many non-romantic kisses, so it, it really is a problem. And also, the word uh, companion and the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene is a very ambiguous word. It doesn't necessarily mean spouse or, or uh, lover. It could mean just friend or travel companion. So the, the Gospel of Philip really doesn't make clear what Dan Brown claims it does. And uh, there's another problem in this book. Dan Brown portrays church history as one long assault against women and what he called the sacred feminine. Dan Brown would have his readers believe that Christianity is to blame for suppress suppressing women. The Bible, on the other hand, clearly teaches that both men and women are made in God's image. We have all sinned and are all in need of redemption. And both men and women are saved by God's grace alone, received through faith alone, in Christ alone. Each woman has been designed by God to fulfill his unique plan for his life. This, by Tim Chafee, is clearly cherry-picking. No matter what Dan Brown says about the intentions of the, the church to suppress women, it's very clear, looking at the Bible that we have, that the church does intend that. When we look at uh, Genesis, uh, the early chapters in, in the Garden of Eden, where the woman is being given her punishments for eating from the tree, one of her punishments is that she will be under men and suppressed by men and have to serve men. And we're told later in the in uh, First Corinthians, I believe, that women have to obey their husbands as they would to God. That is, uh, it's not it's not really a partnership. God is an authoritarian. Whatever He says, you do. That's that's the analogy they give that you should follow your husband as you would God, uh, as the church does to God, which is a dictatorship. Uh, there's there's clear suppression of women, clear inequality expressed in the Bible, and Tim Chafee is trying to fool us here. But I think we all knew that. I mean, this is common knowledge of the. Bible says about women.
uh, attacks on Jesus Christ. So, as you've seen, the Council of Nicaea supposedly made Jesus into God. And uh, the Da Vinci Code claims that Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet. A great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal. So how does Tim Chafee rebut this? Jesus claimed to be God in the Bible. Yes, of course, he, he claims that scripture is what makes Jesus uh, God. So he, he cites a whole bunch of sections from John because uh, John is the only gospel in which Jesus actually proclaims to be the Son of God. There are gospels that, that make that claim on his behalf. For instance, the, the book of Mark starts out right in verse uh, 1 or 2 of the first chapter, saying that Jesus was the Son of God. There, there are claims in those chapters, but they don't come from Jesus' mouth. For instance, when Peter says, I believe you're the Christ, Jesus says, keep that to yourself in Matthew. He would never say such a thing in John, where he claims to be a Son of God often. And so there are some citations from John, because that's the only place you're going to find them. In his uh, last paragraph in this section, Tim Chapey says, Jesus claimed to be able to forgive sins. He healed people from paralysis, leprosy, and blindness. He demonstrated his power over nature and over death. All these miracles testify loud and clear that Jesus truly was and is God. That is a clear logical fallacy because that ignores the fact that other people, not gods in the Bible, are also said to do miracles. All of these miracles are all claimed by by uh, separate uh prophets and apostles and so if that doesn't make them god it doesn't make jesus god either it's a non sequitur uh this next section is about new testament claims that jesus is god and of course it includes mainly sections from john because the, the gospel of john also claims uh for instance john three sixteen, for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son uh there there are plenty of claims in the scripture itself that uh, claim that, G that Jesus is the son of God but you can even find things in uh, other other chapters that come from other sources rather than Jesus claiming it himself which is very interesting let me give you one example after the disciples witnessed Jesus walk on water and calm the storm at, storm at sea they declared truly you are the son of God Matthew 14 33 now from some other author Besides Tim Chafee, I would think, oh, well, that is par for the course. That's what I expect them to cite. But Tim Chafee, in the last chapter, was talking about how to interpret the Bible. And he talks about context. He says that context is key. If a critic says the Bible claims there is no God because they pull it from uh, a verse in Psalms that says, the fool says in his heart there is no God. It's not claiming there is no God. It's putting it in somebody else's mouth. Right here in Matthew, he claims that the scripture says that Jesus is the Son of God by saying that witnesses who saw Jesus walk on water declared that. Again, this is this is exactly what Tim Chafee in the last chapter was telling us not to do. When it supports his case, he does it. Like I said, when I was evaluating the last chapter, they don't follow their standards. So uh, his next chapter here is the early church believed that Jesus is God, which is very interesting because I didn't know this. Um, the, in Dan Brown's novel, he claims that the Council of Nicaea in 325 is what established Jesus Christ as God, even though Mark, the earliest gospel, clearly says it right at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, so he, he has a list. I'm just going to show you the list here of uh, several... Uh, Christians who over the ages from AD 105 to uh, AD 305 all claim that Jesus was Christ, which is interesting. I haven't seen this, this list before. I read it here. And so it, it debunks that claim that was obviously false. And uh, his conclusion, entire books have been written to refute the many errors and lies found in the Da Vinci Code. Uh, this brief summary has demonstrated that Dan Brown's novel is full of falsehoods, even though he has claimed that the historical details are entirely accurate. And I, I just want to point out that it's possible that Jesus was married to, to Mary Magdalene, and it seems very interesting that she's the one woman who's mentioned in all the Gospels very closely. When we have the resurrection narrative, she's the only woman who's described as being at 
all of them. Even even in John, where there are two disciples going to the grave, and it doesn't marry, mention Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary Magdalene is the one who goes to the apostles. She, she seems to be in every story that has to do with Jesus, and you would wonder why she has such devotion, why she follows him so closely above everybody else. But anyway, uh, it, it, I don't think there's anything in the uh, Gospels themselves that actually declare it. And it seems a little strange that it would not be included in the Gospels if it were uh, part of the actual narrative. So anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed this. I didn't. I, I hate discussing factual claims, and I, I don't like this chapter very much because of my bias, because uh, it, I have to agree with the uh, Christian author here on many of his things. He, he picked on an easy target, the Da Vinci Code. Uh, really was full of a lot of factual information. So uh, we'll, we'll get into one that I like more. Uh, chapter 13 is how did we get the Bible in English? I'll have a lot of nice, interesting things to say about that. I actually like that chapter. So uh, I hope you'll catch the next video. Peace out.